Good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you are joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Rachel Starbuck from the Business Review and I will be your host. It is our pleasure to have Ossus with us today who will be discussing Unlocking Your Data to Improve R&D Decision Making. Today's guest speakers are Friedrich Hubner, um, Business De Development Manager, and sadly we don't have Dr. Natasha Castro, Business Consultant, with us today, but I would like to introduce Michael Ingalls, Head of Consulting, as the replacement speaker. I'd like to welcome you to our new webinar platform. You'll notice that this webinar is browser-based, so if you disconnect, please click on the link that you received via email to rejoin. And in order to ask questions, you can send them in via the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen or use the top left hand box. We'll allocate around 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session to address any questions or thoughts that you may have. If you click on the green resource list widget, there are a couple of PDFs to view or download from our speakers. We, will, we also have a short survey for you to fill out which can be found in the red survey widget or will be available at the end of the webinar. Please use the help widget if you require any assistance. So without further ado, please allow me to welcome Friedrich. Good afternoon to everybody. For some of you, it may be a good morning. Thank you for attending our webinar. Today we are talking about unlocking your data to improve R&D decision making. So in times of tighter budgets and need for improved R&D performance, Decision making becomes a critical part in many organizations, and we will show you how to improve there. Let's take a look on our agenda. First, I will give you a short introduction about OSTOS and what we do. Then we take a look at important R&D questions and where data integration may help with. Then Michael will present the main three points and talk about effectiveness, standardization, and data quality, and give you real insight what OSTOS may do for you in the field of application and data integration. I assume not too many will have learned something about OSTOS. So who are OSTOS? OSTOS was founded in 1996 with OSTOS Germany. In 2013, we started Ostos Incorporated based in Aventura, Florida in the US. And this year, we've opened another site in China. And today, I'm proud to announce that just recently, we opened another site in Boston, Massachusetts. So you are among the first to learn this news. We are acting as a global partner for R&D organizations. I know Ostos has more than 70 domain experts. Our implementation teams bring together both science background in chemistry, biology, physics, as well as IT background. And we regard this as one of our key strengths. In short terms, we, are, we transform the very complex R&D environment <coughs> into manageable units, uh, systems, and projects to achieve better processes at our customers and <coughs> help uh, decision making being more effective. How do we do that? To nearly every project, we add some innovation. We built the first R&D search engine. We have done software framework development, which was new at the time when we started it. And today, we are uh, the implementation partner for the Alatra project, which is also exploring new space in defining a data standard for analytical data and metadata handling across the lab primarily aimed for the life science industry. We will cover allotrope in some detail in this presentation, and if you want to learn more about it, please drop us an email in the communication box. Astus offers consulting services for process analysis, lab optimization, uh, and science and IT interaction. Our solution teams cover the design, implementation, and deployment of solutions for life science R&D with applications like LIMS, ELN, or custom-built applications, but also <coughs> uh, homegrown uh, or custom-developed applications. We cover the whole application lifecycle and support for our customers. Also, during the run phase, we provide services by on-site consultancy. Another strength of Astros is our partner portfolio. We are, in a sense, independent from the vendors. 
but we are <clears throat> open to integrate uh, any third-party product when it's a need in the project. Our strategic partners are clearly IDBS and BioVia, but there is a long list of other vendors we work with, like ACD Labs, Dotmatics, Thermo Fisher, and of course the lab device vendors. Uh, much of the time we use Oracle technology. So this is the introduction uh, about OSTUS. Let's take a look on uh, some of the challenges that we see in the <coughs> business of our customers. So what is the challenge of R&D today? At nearly every place we go, the present landscape consists of a set of applications like the ones we have shown here at the bottom. Each of it comes with its own data store, has different data formats, interfaces, and owns its own uh, master data and so on. But scientists uh, don't want to tackle problems with uh, data conversion, data mapping, data copying. They want to answer their scientific questions, uh, like the ones we depict here. So uh, they are questioning whether to promote this or the other substance uh, to candidate level. Um, they are questioning themselves how they can pull together all the data in real time. They are investigating new indications and are looking after the experimental results. They <coughs> ask how many of the tests were performed and what was the outcome of it. And they are looking for old data that they have generated years before, but they don't know where it is now. Or they may have other questions. Uh, if you are from a different domain, perhaps, uh, your questions will be different in the subject, but very similar in the way that they are somehow unrelated to the IT applications at hand to you. And of course, there are other challenges in pharma that we see, for example, bringing patient together patient data together uh, for personalized uh, medicine, handling vast amounts of data uh, for NGS, or coping with the diverse set of data formats uh, used in biologic research. Obviously, there is a need for data integration to make these applications talk to each other and to produce answers to the questions uh, that the scientists have. So what is data integration then uh, all about? So data integration spans the whole life cycle of data. This means from digital birth onto computation, onto reporting, and perhaps to the reuse of data, and finally to archiving. Uh, we regard data integration as a family of interrelated techniques uh, like data federation, data replication, data warehouse building, use of search engines, application interfacing, of course, database technology, and maybe also programming. The important thing is that data integration adds value to the scientific process by increasing data quality, optimize the data movement, or reduce the time that scientists spend on searching data. It also will allow a repurposing of data and make IT management more effective uh, by integrating different applications and avoid the uh, manual data transfer. And in the end, they will also ease, uh, it will ease the data and application migration. It is not shown on this slide, but in principle, um, there are three implementation options available to your IT when dealing with data integration. The first one is pure relational technology. If your data is stable and consists of uh, mainly formatted data, the second would be using semantic technology. If your data structures are likely to change or you just want to relate key data items, this is rather new technology and it needs some base to build on for feeding uh, the content of the ontologies. The third would be using a hybrid relational and semantic model combining the strengths of each area. It's not easily said which is the best one, but OSTUS clearly would be in a position to help you to decide which technology is most appropriate for the problem you're tackling. It's also important to understand that we are not bound to uh, the examples that follow. Uh, 
we just use them uh, to have very specific items uh, to show how these uh, disciplines could be applied. So I hand now over to Rachel, and she will uh, conduct two parts about uh, data integration. Thank you very much. So please select the answer that is relevant to you and then click Submit. So today's polling question is, did you do an integration project before? And your answers are from A, yes, or B, no. So what are you expecting from this question then? Well, we would like to see uh, <coughs> uh, whether somebody has experience already or has uh, been struggling in some of these uh, projects and possibly we could be of advice or, or help to them. Perfect. So let's click on to the results. So, no, actually got 68%. Are these interesting for you? Yes, definitely. So uh, one third of, of um, our audience has already an experience and, and uh, tried to do that. And uh, two thirds, uh, roughly, uh, have not done anything in that area, but obviously, We'll be interested in, in, in doing so perhaps in the future, otherwise uh, we would not discuss uh, here today. Thank you very much. And today's second polling question is, what do you regard as the biggest challenge for an integration project? And your answers are from A, technical data integration, B, data standardization, C, ensuring data quality, and D, change management. Please submit your answers. So what are you expecting from this question then? Well, uh, we have not done a poll in, in that uh, area. and um, We would like to see um, where to focus on in the, the, with the project teams on our side, uh, which is uh, we would like to tackle the, the most difficult uh, problem and have an eye on it. Okay, thank you. And now we'll have a look at the results. So data standardization has taken the lead. Are these interesting results for you? <laughs> yes. We would not have, have expected um, to be in, in that clear lead. So it clearly it's important, but uh, this is a clear lead. We did not uh, anticipate that. Thank you very much. OK. And Risha, I assume it's now my uh, my turn. So good morning and uh, good uh, <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, maybe some of you are uh, expecting Natasha, but uh, unfortunately she uh, got sick, so she lost her voice. Um, so I will take over and guide you through the rest of the presentation. So in this part, I'll talk about how data integration can make your organization more effective. To illustrate this, we have selected a project which we performed together with one of our customers. Uh, this customer, a mid-sized farmer, was struggling to get all their preclinical data together in time to make adequate decisions on whether to pass or fail a compound. They had a wealth of compound information stored by their IT landscape, which is scattered. Data are captured in different applications and systems. This IT footprint was quite broad, including a standard software solution from different vendors, but also custom-based solutions. Each of this application or system has their own type of data model and maintain own vocabularies, data catalogs, and dictionaries. Yeah. The user experience uh, was different from application to application. User interfaces followed different conventions and design principles. All these applications and systems can be considered as best of breed and support the business processes within the scientific departments very well. Yet there was very little standardization across the system and communication between those systems. So it was very hard for the project scientists to get the information that they need since it was bound to different silos, technologies, or even experts. This scenario is something we have encountered at several other of our customers too. And in their cases, we typically see the following issues. So the use of manual copying and pasting of information, most often in, in Excel. Uh, the, the use of 
private databases or data repositories which are um, um, hosting or including either project lists, project relevant data, the lack of ad hoc querying the data across scientific disciplines, and the lack of integrated and real-time views incorporating data across the scientific domains. As a consequence, data is not available on time for decision making. So what was our solution uh, in, in, this, in this project? This is shown then here. So we, we went uh, and we wanted to integrate all the data in one central repository. Yeah? The central repository yeah, then will feed a single front end, we call it the magic front end, which has a standardized way and access to the data. It provides different type of, 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 of function, which is then shown here on the next, uh, which is shown then later on. Um, the introduction of such a complex system is not just a technological challenge for the IT departments. As there consists a very tight linkage between process and application, it is important that one is prepared to make changes to current processes and workflows. So the new data warehouse should be part of the process and not simply a piece of technology. So how did we achieve that? First, at the pharma company, this uh, project was considered as a change process affecting the way how people are working with the data. For that, you need to prepare the ground, and this can only be done with support of top management involving stakeholders and experts alike right from the beginning and for the whole project. With the introduction of a new technology, the interaction between scientists and application and data will change and create new processes and workflows. Again, involve the end user in the design of these processes as early as possible. Data inoperability is the requirement to query and share data and create cross-functional views. While this seems a more technological challenge, this hits right in the heart of the data integration. That means combining data in one context. To provide this context is a clear mandate of the business since it involves question of data sharing, data relationship, and definitions. During this project, we followed a very well-defined process, which involved um, defined iterations of requirements, implementations of configuration, and testing. Here we relied on continuous feedback from the, uh, from the end users. And here I can only emphasize the importance of end user interaction. It is important or it has proven useful to run this project similar to an ordinary preclinical project with regular meetings, by this keeping communication channel open and informing and involving scientists in the, pro in the, in the progress. And finally, for the integration, we used our reference architecture. Uh, which we used before at other customers. This is shown here on our next slide. As you can see, this reference architecture follows a modular approach, consisting of the central research data warehouse, which is filled by numerous uh, source systems. On top of the data warehouse, the query and retrieval and analytical tools are placed. The source systems communicate with the reference systems via well-defined interfaces. The data which we found in the source systems are either structured or semi-structured. Semi-structured in that context means that, that they are actually in some way also providing a metadata framework. However, in contrast to structured data, the format definition is not very formal and the metadata extraction is based on complex business logic. The data is moved to the data warehouse by an ETL process, which includes several compute engines shown below. But before the data enter the uh, data warehouse, they pass through a staging area where the data is checked for quality, correctness, and completeness, the operational data store. This system is forming a bridge between the current world and the new process. It represents some kind of staging area and provides a flexible platform for data curation and data management. In the third part of this presentation, I will explain the benefits of such a curation management platform, or ODS as we call it. But first, I want to draw your attention to something else which is essential for data integration. This is the term data standardization. I can bring the next slide. Yeah. Maybe for some of you, this, sounds, this looks very familiar. Yeah. Data comes in different formats. 
terms may not mean the same or for the same things different terms are used. The data format question is an interesting problem and it's very common in our industry with all these different source systems, while in other areas the data formats are much more standardized. So much of that you don't even notice anymore. So in our day-to-day -day life we use a lot of standards. I can listen and share my music easily via Spotify or Netflix, no? or send you my holiday pictures and can open them. I can work with my bank from home, communicate with my family, share videos, and so on and so on. I can actually distribute the music on different instruments, uh, woofer, speakers, and so on. This all seems so easy. But for many of the systems in our area, area, these standards don't exist with consequences which affect us daily. Maybe the next, yeah. Most of us will recognize uh, the following picture. So in our laboratories, you have all types of instruments that are capturing data for you. All these instruments deliver the results in their own data format. This often requires you to either use the instrument vendor solution for, the, for processing the data, or forces you to transcribe or convert the data if you want to use it in another application. The root cause is shown in that slide, which is the either incompatibility of software or the lack of standard uh, file format or the inconsistency in the metadata or a combination of all three. As Friedrich told you in the beginning, Ostus works closely with Allotrope, a foundation which aims to create standards for data formats. As Allotrope IT architects, we are helping them to create these standards and provide a toolkit that enables use of these standards and metadata. Allotrope is also setting up a core vocabulary for use with these standards. If you would like some more information on this or on Allotrope, please use the email option as, uh, and let us know. We will contact you after this webinar. Now well, let's get back to talking the same language. I'm sure that most of you try to maintain a consistent vocabulary between your systems, but unless you have a central master data system, uh, chains are, that are, every system has its own dictionary, and as a consequence, it's likely that terms are not used consistently. In most systems, you will probably maintain lists of master data, which have grown over the years. If you want to integrate data from these different systems, you will need to align these dictionaries. And I will come back to that in the ODS section. Let's have a look now at ontologies and their use. Ontologies represent a semantic technology. This means next to data and content, this technology encodes meanings and enables us to better communicate, speak the same language. Ontologies can be considered as a new dimension to structure and model content and knowledge. And this is applied in an increasingly complex domain. Relationships between concepts are becoming electronically amenable by this technology, and in particular, uh, biology is benefiting from this. There are many public ontologies out there which can help you significantly in ordering and categorizing your data. The example shown here is actually not an ontology, but could be a meta-ontology. This meta-ontology is defining a protein which is characterized by a name, a sequence, an organism, and a molecular function. Yeah. If you then, the ontologies or the taxonomies or vocabularies then, then give you the names and synonyms, for example, for the organism in some kind of hierarchical order. So how can, could an ontology help you? This is shown here on this slide. This shows in an abstract way the relationship between the modular function and DNA capabilities, which is getting more specific by the notation of binding to a double-stranded DNA. A typical use case is that a customer would like to integrate recent and very specific data with quite old, not very detailed data. The question is, can he do so? If one protein is character characterized as double-stranded DNA, but the other one is just um, exemplified as a DNA binder. Yeah, given the knowledge of the ontology, that's 
double-stranded DNA binding is an overarching concept and involves double-stranded DNA binding as well. So in that, these two uh, data sets could be combined. This is, uh, example sounds trivial for a biologist, but it is without semantic technology, it is a problem which is hard to crack for computers. The next slide we show then a second example. One can define that a DNA binding protein which regulates the gene expression is a transcription factor. If now a protein is annotated with double-stranded DNA binding capabilities and positive regulation of transcription capabilities, then the computer knows that this is, this, this is a transcription factor, although it is not explicitly described in the data set. So this means that this technolo technology enables biologists to identify protein function. Even this function is not directly stated in the data set itself. But be aware. Yeah. Building a model from inferences can help in discovering new perspectives and knowledge. However, we have to be quite careful in doing so in some cases. So I provide you here a, a kind of an anti-example. In this context, we int introduce the platypus. It is a mammal, and a quite a rare mammal. But if we define mammals as viviparous animals, that, that means animals that give live birds, we have a problem with this creature because it's actually egg-lagging. Either we need to review the definition of a mammal as a viviparous or the definition that a platypus is a mammal. This means that also ontologies can be used to check data and validate models' consistency. Coming back to our reference architecture, I have shown you that the two areas, data standards and data formats, and data concepts, concepts like ontologies, glossaries, and control vocabularies form pivotal elements in a, data, in a data integration. This slide shows you how these elements have been incorporated as part of our data integration reference uh, architecture. So on the left-hand side, you see the data format box, which is bridging between the source systems and, and our ODS. And on, 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 on the bottom, we have then uh, the box which is describing ontology, overarching, metadata extraction, also the ETL, uh, different uh, glossaries, vocabularies, and in general, semantic concepts. I think what I need to say is this uh, looks, uh, this modular reference structure is of course some kind of solution, a general solution for a lot of problems. I need to n note that Dependent on the problem case, I think some of these modules can be either changed or can be uh, deleted uh, at all. So now we come to uh, the last point. Da data standardization and the use of the same language will significantly help you when you start to integrate your data. And ideally, all source systems use the same languages in the same format. But what is not the case? But if you are combining many different uh, source systems, some old and some new, what kind of data issues do you encounter then? Data integration projects put a magnifying glass on your data, and during such a project you, feel you will find many, many data issues. Incomplete data like missing data uh, and, and so on. How can you assure the data quality of your integrated solution? In that context, we define the four I's in data integration. It's incompleteness, it's incorrectness, incomprehensibility, uh, and inconsistency. Incomplete means that data entries are missing. For example, you expect the description of the function of a protein, but it's not there. Incorrect, this is quite the hardest one. Only an expert can, with a certain type of background can judge whether a data entry is correct or not. Incomprehensible, incompreh yeah. For example, data are not well defined and can be interpreted in different ways, or sometimes also in an insufficient way. For example, uh, um, a compound is, is defined as high, uh, highly soluble, yeah 
by that only providing a qualitative indication of its physical chemical properties. But in a certain type of concept, this is not a context, this is not concrete enough. Inconsistent. Yeah? Here we're referring to different or um, heterogeneous conventions. For example, one data system is using empty values to indicate no entries. Other uh, uh, systems are using a sequence, for example, of uh, four nines. So these four I's uh, are, in our view, that's one of the, let's say, major hurdles that we have in data integration. And maybe I now uh, give back to Rachel, uh, because Rachel has prepared a small poll. Rachel, can you please raise the next question? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. So your third question for today is, what do you see as the biggest issue with your data? And your answers are from A, incompleteness, B, incorrectness, C, incomprehensibility, D, inconsistency, or E, all of the above. If you could please submit your answers now. So what are you expecting from these results then? Yeah, from our, <laughs> in the beginning, I would say I'm not expecting it. We have a clear view yeah, on what we could expect. I think uh, we would be surprised, for example, there is, I think, a fifth option, and we would like to learn what could be then also other problems with data integration. Thank you very much. And now we will find out. So inconsistency, you got 45.5%. Are these interesting results for you? Oh, yes, they are. I think I need a little bit of time to digest them. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Incorrectness is zero. Uh, I, would be, I would be very much interested <laughs> in drilling down here in that scenario. Um, but, okay, I see that inconsistency is really taking the lead. Yeah, this, is, this is of interest to us. Thank you. Okay, so what I will do is now in this part of the webinar, yeah, we will focus on the operational data store. As pointed out before, the integration of data poses a challenge to experts, business experts, and IT people alike. Curation of data, managing dictionaries, controlling vocabularies, the annotation and translation of terms, this all has to be done uh, on a daily level and in particular in the context of a data migration project. But next to this more content or knowledge related uh, challenges, there are also logistic uh, type of challenges. For example, uh, what type of entries are new? Which data has been modified? Which data have been deleted? So are there any solutions uh, out there which uh, deal with this type of everyday data management problem? As part of our intensive interaction with our customers, we have developed a reference architecture, which is shown here for the operational data, uh, data store. This system includes several functions supporting the data integration, the data management, and data mart building. It functions as a, a switch integrating technology of different vendors, for example, from IDBS, BioVIA, or ACD Labs. The system provides interfaces to source systems, helps in data curation, data processing, and loading of data. In addition, the system include, include components supporting the management of glossaries and vocabularies and providing a user interface to scientists, scientists which need to manage, govern, and regulate these concepts. The scientists are most often not very well familiar with the technological details of this informatics platform. Yeah. So the ODS administrator, which is on top, a part of that uh, infrastructure, helps them in their daily business to fulfill the task of data curation and data management. The beauty of this solution is that it can function as a bridge between the current technology in use and new capabilities which are developed on top. And by that, actually keeping the assets that have been built in the past. On the next slide, I will show you how the ODS administrator is supporting the data management or the data curation process. So here you see how we can link the results from the source databases to the data warehouse. It shows a screenshot from, from our ODS system. 
On the left hand side on the top, you see different groupings of source results. In that case, they are domain specific. In that case, they're referring to biology, chemistry, experiment, uh, experimental uh, physical chemical, physical chemistry, and so on. If you look, for example, at the screening results, you see that the following results are available in the data warehouse. And results, with that I mean, for example, the result type EC50. Now this can be linked, this EC50 can be linked now with the result types in the source databases. And not only the result types are linked, but also the, the results themselves. The automatic configuration picks up the information and from the source systems based on the naming. So this is done in the background without further interference by the end user. We had uh, looked at the results. Now we are looking at the conditions. Uh, we have here a similar mapping as we did for, for uh, as we did before. Again, conditions are grouped in in some kind of of domain domain specific boxes. Yeah. And also here we can perform uh, a mapping between conditions within, let's say, the source systems and the data warehouse. Optionally, these conditions can be linked to a glossary. Yeah. In the ODS themselves, which is shown then on the, on the next uh, slide, we have the option to maintain a glossary. Yeah. Glossary is a set of, of, of definitions and in terms. Here on the left hand side we see that we have actually different glossaries available referring to biology, chemistry. We have also overarching uh, glossaries. If we now look at the biology we see that the following glossaries could be then available with the following glossary names. The ODS administrator helps and the data steward yeah, or the end user in administrating these uh, terms in the glossary. So he can then group them, he can override them, he can neglect them. This is all possible in this type of application. Data curation, I then uh, creating a unified vocabulary. This is shown here on the next on, on, on the next slide. In many cases, as we experience, um, the same the same term with the same meaning is spelled in different way. And the number of permutation can be really huge. Yeah. This is, of course, a consequence of sometimes not very well controlled vocabularies, but also in the in the in the context of um, bridging um, uh, data sources from different scientific disciplines. This is really a scenario which happens very often. So here, in that case, we have, for example, heart as defined as an organ, liver defined as uh, as an organ, and we have different spelling of that one. And of course, it's very, very difficult for a data warehouse or a front-end uh, application that you, have, that you are only dealing with one concept and with one term. The next slide brings me to data enrichment. Sometimes when you are, um, when you are introducing a new type of workflow and new type of, of concepts, scientists would like to enrich the data and in particular, when, they, when it comes to querying, would like to use new com concepts which actually are not uh, showing up in the old source systems. Yeah. By, that, by that, you not only need to enrich the original data, but you have on top of the data, you have to introduce a concept. Yeah. And you have to um, map those concepts yeah, to, to uh, entries in your source systems. Sometimes this is possible. Sometimes you have, in addition to that, you have also to annotate then these uh, uh, new concepts with data that can be really contribute quite large deal of your project. And this is shown here uh, on that slide where we then bridge with, uh, different biological essays to a concept which we call a meta protocol, which is then bringing together different um, uh, protocol in one we call it overarching concept. So this brings me almost to the end of uh, our webinar. So what are the benefits of, the, of an operational data storm? First, it, it works like a 
intermediate staging area, and by that it ensures data quality. It supports the data standardization by remapping source attributes. It helps you in setting up and manage a controlled vocabulary. And it helps you also, let's say, in a migration context, in the translation uh, and bridging the current or old world to the new world. And it also allows you to enrich your data, either annotating or introducing no, new concepts with, and to annotate them. In addition, the ODS user admin interface yeah, helps data stewards to operate independent from IT experts yeah, and resolve most of the data and data quality issues by themselves. So what are the learning messages? Yeah. An integrated view on your data will allow you to make better and faster decisions. Yeah. Using accepted data standards and harmonized vocabularies makes uh, combining uh, data easier. And in particular, from our side, an operational data store will enable you to greatly improve your data quality. And with that, I'm at the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attention and I hand over to Rachel because she will then host the Q&A session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you to everyone who has already sent their questions in. Um, please continue to send in your questions via the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen or please use the top left hand box. We will try and get through as many questions as possible. However, if we do not have time to answer them all in this webinar, then Friedrich and Michael will get back to you at a later date. So for your first question, what is absolutely essential for a data integration project to succeed? So I think the most important part is that you have management support and buy-in of, of the users. This is the pivotal requirement. If people do not see that actually they, that there is a change needed, I think you won't actually get the, the drive from the business. Thank you very much. And how often do you see companies which are suffering efficiency loss through lack of information access? Hmm. So, we have a couple of numbers. So the study ranged from 20 to 25% that a scientist spends on data searching and data integration and data gathering. Yeah. Uh, knowledge worker in our industry spend about 12% of the time, yeah, 12 to 15%. This translates actually to five hours per week. Thank you very That's much. That's our You finished, sorry? Yeah, I'm finished. Thank you. Yep. And your next question. How much time and effort is lost on average gathering data together? Now, this was I, I gave the answer before, but I can uh, um, repeat that. So in our experience, really, it really depends on the environment. Yeah? But if we, if we are referring to some kind of Excel-ish type of uh, um, background, then it's 20 to 25%. So one of uh, one day in a week, is spending, let's say, a scientist in gathering its information. Thank you very much. And what is the best approach to standardize assays and harmonize data dictionaries? <laughs> That's a tough one. Yeah. Um, First, speak to the business people. Yeah. You need the expert. Yeah. Um, they actually know what is not possible. They could also give you a direction. Yeah. Um, what is very important, look over the fence. Yeah. Check actually what other people are doing. Talk to other people. Yeah. And then bring this all together and define actually in then the context that is needed for you uh, in order to drive your business. I think you can, of course, gather pain points, which are the first indicators. Yeah? But by looking around more broadly, I think you maybe also um, get some kind of 
interesting ideas, surprises, and they should be open in that phase. So by that, I think in the beginning, it's some kind of process where you really are collecting information and bringing all together. Yeah? And then together with the expert in the business, uh, you make then, let's say, the definition, what do you define as context? Thank you very much. And what is the optimal choice of technology for data integration? Mm -hmm. So I'll take that one, Rachel. So it depends uh, on the situation, I would say. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, uh, three basin, basic technologies around, uh, which is relational, semantic, and also a combination. <coughs> and uh, our guidance uh, would be to uh, was the technology uh, that we have a look on the data sources that have to be integrated. <clears throat> the more structured the data is, uh, you, the more likely you will tend to go for uh, some relational integration technology. The more unstructured uh, data you are looking for, uh, and there is a need for flexible unknown uh, linkages, the more likely uh, you may opt for a semantic technology or a hybrid solution. We would welcome uh, to enter in this type of uh, discussion with uh, the audience. If there is a need, we would be of help uh, to decide on uh, these technology choices. Thank you very much. And ensuring data quality is a result of the other three, isn't it? Sorry, I haven't got that one. Sorry, I'll repeat the question. So, Ensuring data quality is the result of the other three, isn't it? The integration, yeah, the standardization, and quality. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Sorry, did you want to go on? Sorry. Hello. No. Go ahead. Um, so, the next question. Um, which benefits do you see from the investment in data integration? Um, I think there are several things. That is, um, you are taking decision faster and quicker. Yeah? And also the, the quality of that decision is better. Um, you are involving more people if you set up a system which allows you to share data. Yeah? By that, even that, not only this decision-making platform is getting broader, but also um, the expertise is getting broader. Um, by having a data integration in itself, I think you will then work also on the data quality and you will bring up some treasures which may be, or which were lying around in your old source system, and we then you rediscover. Yeah. Uh, and another beneficial effect we have seen is a better, yeah, is this common understanding. Now people are talking about their data, yeah, because now they have a common understanding what it means, because they are now talking the same language. Okay, thank you very much. And that is actually about all we have time for. So that just leaves me to thank Friedrich and Michael for what was a great presentation. And thanks to OSSUS for sponsoring this session. To the attendees, you will receive an email shortly telling you how you can access the on-demand version of this webinar. Or you can access this through our website, which is www.business-review-webinars.com. We do look forward to sharing further webinars with you so please do keep an eye out on the website just mentioned and follow us on Twitter, which is at BRWebinars, for daily updates and also join, in, join our LinkedIn group, which is Business Review Webinars. So thank you once again, and I hope you all have a nice day. Thank you also, Miles.